to read the questions before you hear each extract and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mr. Victor Rosario. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I know your problem? Well, I'm getting frequent nausea and vomiting, with an aspiration pneumonia and abdominal discomfort. I had an endoscopy which revealed a small ulcer after dropping my hematocrit. Now, I feel anemic. I had a CT scan last week that showed pneumatosis and my cecum worrisome for ischemic colitis, bilateral hydronephrosis and multiple liver lesions. Yesterday, I had multiple bowel movements and passing flatus, and had epigastric pain. Okay, what's your age? 67, Doctor. Do you smoke or drink? I have a chronic alcohol use, but I've stopped smoking long back. Tell me your past medical history. I have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, history of pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia, osteoporosis, alcoholism, microcytic anemia. Well... Your physical examination shows you are afebrile. Your heart rate is in the hundreds to 120s, at times with atrial fibrillation. Respiratory rate is 17 to 20. Blood pressure, 130s to 150s and 60s to 70s. Your abdomen is distended with tenderness mainly in the upper abdomen, but very difficult to localize. The CT scan shows pneumatosis in the cecum, with an enlarged cecum filled with stool and air fluid levels with chronically dilated small bowel. There is a possibility of ischemic cecum with possible metastatic disease, bilateral hydronephrosis on atrial fibrillation, aspiration pneumonia, chronic alcohol abuse, acute renal failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, anemia with gastric ulcer. I would recommend getting a repeat CT scan to assess it further to see if there's worsening pneumatosis versus resolution to further evaluate the liver lesions and make decisions regarding planning at that time. Since you have frequent desaturations secondary to your aspiration pneumonia and any surgical procedure or any surgical intervention would certainly require intubation that would then necessitate long-term ventilator care. So I will look at your CT scan and make decisions based on the findings. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Noah Baxter. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I have intolerance to allergies, inhalant and environmental allergies. 
okay, do you get any kind of reactions like an itchy rash, throat or tongue swelling, shortness of breath, vomiting, lightheadedness, and low blood pressure? Clinically, these symptoms show the presence of anaphylaxis, no doctor. Or else, do you get itchy red welts called angioedema that develop on your skin? No doctor. Are you taking any medication for allergies? No doctor. May I know your past medical history? Uh, six months back, when I was under dialysis due to renal failure, I had an acute event of perioral swelling, uh, etiology uncertain. The diagnosis results showed that the allergic reaction was due to Keflax that was used to treat a cellulitis dialysis shunt infection. What medications are you taking now? I am taking a Tanolol for controlling my blood pressure, sodium bicarbonate, Lovatsa, and Dialovite. I didn't have any other issues upon my treatment and discharge. That included corticosteroid therapy and antihistamine therapy and monitoring. What were the surgeries performed? Perm cath insertion three times in peritoneal dialysis. Are you allergic to any medications? Yes, heparin causes thromocytopenia. Do you drink or smoke? No, doctor. May I know your family history of diseases? My family members have severe heart disease, carcinoma, and food allergies. Well, your test report shows your blood pressure is 128.78, pulse 70, temperature is 97.8, weight is 207 pounds, and height is 5 feet 7 inches. I suspect you have developed acute anaphylaxis. I would suggest you to go for a radioallergosorbin test, a blood test using radioimmunoassay tests to investigate specific IgE antibodies to determine the substances a subject is allergic to. I shall recommend further treatment and medications upon the test results. If the test report shows any specific food or inhalant allergen that is found to be quite high on the sensitivity scale, I would likely recommend that you avoid the offending agent. Right now, I would recommend you to stop further usage of cephalosporin antibiotics, which may be the cause of your allergic reaction, and I would consider your case as an allergy. Being on Atenolol, it would be very difficult to treat acute anaphylaxis. I am prescribing an EpiPen in the event of acute angioedema or allergic reaction or sensation of impeding allergic reaction, and you have to proceed directly to the emergency room for further evaluation and treatment recommendations after the administration of an EpiPen. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a doctor explaining to his patient about a bone marrow biopsy. Doctor, I was told to undergo a bone marrow biopsy and I'm very worried about this test. Can you suggest how I need to prepare for this? Well, a bone marrow biopsy is normally advised to diagnose and monitor a variety of conditions. It can also be performed to diagnose or determine the extent of certain types of cancer. A bone marrow biopsy is performed through the procedure called a bone marrow aspiration to obtain a sample of the bone marrow, which is the blood forming portion of the inner core of the bone. Usually, a bone marrow aspiration is taken from the pelvic bone called the ilium. That can be accessed from the lower back near the hip. The sample can also be taken from the centre bone in the chest called the sternum or the front of the pelvic bone near the groin. Question 26. You hear two hospital managers talking about an information session for people who want to do voluntary work. So. How's the planning going for the future volunteer information evening? Well, we've had a lot of RSVPs already, so I'm really happy with the way the event management systems have worked. 
Having a bit of trouble sourcing some good catering, though. Considering that these people are freely giving their time to come and learn what is expected, I really want to provide some nice food and refreshments for them. Have uh, you got any contacts you like using? Yeah, look, that's right. It's a small thing we can do for those participants. I'll tell you what, I'll ask around my team for some recommendations for something a bit special. Great, thanks. I really appreciate it. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a doctor on different categories of chemotherapy drugs. Hello, doctor. What are the different categories of chemotherapy drugs? There are several types of chemotherapy drugs that vary both in their functioning and on which part of the cell cycle they work. Alkylating agents are nonspecific drugs that directly damage DNA. Examples include cytoxin and myloran. Antimetabolites work by pretending they are nutritional sources for the cell. Cancer cells take up these drugs instead of nutrients and essentially starve to death. Examples include navelbine, VP16, and Gemzar. Plant alkaloids include drugs obtained from plant sources. Examples include cosmogen and mutamycin. Anti-tumor antibiotics differ from the types of antibiotics used to treat bacterial infections. These drugs work by preventing cancer cells from reproducing. Examples include adriamycin and cerubidine. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now read the question. Doctor, what are the various types of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? There are different kinds of functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Gastronomy usually forms in the head of the pancreas and sometimes forms in the small intestine. Most gastrinomas are malignant. Insulinoma forms in the head, body or tail of the pancreas. Insulinomas are usually benign. Glucogenoma forms in the tail of the pancreas. Most glucogenomas are malignant. VIPomas, which make vasoactive intestinal peptide. Somatostatinomas, which make somatostatin. Question 29. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about gall stones. Now read the question. Gallstones are formed due to an imbalance in the composition of bile, resulting in hard stones that are made of pigment or crystallized cholesterol, or a mixture of the two. They can range in size from as small as a sand grain to as large as a tennis ball. One can have a single large gallstone, dozens to hundreds of smaller gallstones, or a combination of both small and large stones. There are two types of gallstones. Typically, patients with pigment stones have cirrhosis of the liver, biliary tract infections, and hereditary blood disorders, including sickle cell anemia. These are all conditions that produce too much bilirubin, of which the stones are made of. Pigment stones tend to be dark brown or black. Cholesterol stones are formed as a result of bile that is made of too much cholesterol or bilirubin and not enough bile salts. They can also form when the gallbladder fails to empty during the digestive process. They are usually yellow-green gallstones, which are the most common type. Question 30. You hear a doctor briefing the junior doctors about trigger point injection. Now read the question. Trigger point injection. Often muscle spasm prolongs and doesn't respond to regular treatments like ice and heat, physiotherapy, or muscle relaxants. In order to relax the muscle, either a local anesthetic or a combination of local anesthetic medication and a steroid medication will be injected into the tight bundle of muscles known as trigger points. In this process, the skin of the patient will be cleaned and chlorhexidine and a small needle will be inserted into the trigger point muscle. Generally, up to four trigger points are injected in one session. However, when injecting up to 10 trigger points, the patient will feel very painful. It is essential for the patient to inform the physician when the needle contacts the painful trigger point, as this is where the medicine has to be injected. They may feel a temporary discomfort. 
There can be many possible complications after a trigger point injection, including mild bleeding and skin irritation and infection. Although the positive result of the treatment cannot be ascertained, the local anesthetic will numb the area for three hours. The corticosteroids remain in the tissue in active form for about one month. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a psychiatrist called Dr. Anthony Gibbons, giving a presentation about the role of case stories in medicine. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, my name's Anthony Gibbons. I'm a clinical psychiatrist and published author. I'd like to talk about something that's relevant to all medical professionals, the use of narratives in medicine. Let me begin with a case study sent to me by a colleague who shares my interest in the subject. The study featured a 30-year-old man who was hospitalised for severe panic attacks. He was treated with narcoanalysis, but feeling no relief, turned to alcohol and endured years of depression and social isolation. Four decades later, he was back in the psychiatric system, but for the first time he was prescribed the antidepressant Zoloft. Six weeks later, he was discharged because the panic attacks and depression had disappeared. He lived a full life until his death 19 years later. If the narrative was striking, it was even more so for its inclusion in a medical journal. Repeatedly, I've been surprised by the impact that even lightly sketched case histories can have on readers. In my first book, I wrote about personality and how it might change on medication. My second was concerned with theories of intimacy. Readers, however, often use the books for a different purpose, identifying depression. Regularly, I received and still receive phone calls, people saying, my husband's just like X, one figure from a clinical example. Other readers wrote to say that they'd recognised themselves. Seeing that they weren't alone gave them hope. Encouragement is another benefit of case description, familiar to us in an age when everyone's writing their biography. But this isn't to say that stories are a panacea to issues inherent in treating patients, and there can be disadvantages. Consider my experience prescribing Prozac. When certain patients reported feeling better than well after receiving it, I presented these examples first in essays for psychiatrists and then in my book, where I surrounded the narrative material with accounts of research. In time, my loosely supported descriptions led others to do controlled trials that confirmed the phenomenon. But doctors hadn't waited for those controlled trials. 
in advance, the better-than-well hypothesis had served as a tentative fact. Treating depression, colleagues looked out for personality change, even aimed for it, even though this wasn't my intended outcome. This brings me to my next point. Often, the knowledge that informs clinical decisions emerges when you stand back from it, like an impressionist painting. What initially seems like randomly scattered information begins to come together, and what you see is the bigger picture. That's where the true worth of anecdote lies, beyond its role as illustration hypothesis builder and low-level guidance for practice. Storytelling can act as a modest counterbalance to a narrow focus on data. If we rely solely on evidence, we risk moving toward a monoculture, whereby patients and their afflictions become reduced to inanimate objects. A result I'd consider unfortunate, since. There are many ways to influence people for the better. It's been my hope that while we wait for conclusive science, stories will preserve diversity in our theories of mind. My recent reading of outcome trials of antidepressants has strengthened my suspicion that the line between research and storytelling can be fuzzy. In medicine, randomized trials are rarely large enough to provide guidance on their own. Statisticians amalgamate many studies through a technique called meta-analysis. The first step of the process, deciding which data to include, colours the findings. Effectively, the numbers are narrative. Put simply, evidence-based medicine is judgment-based medicine, in which randomised trials are carefully assessed and given their due. I don't think we need to be embarrassed about this. Our substantial formal findings require integration. The danger. Is in pretending otherwise. I've long felt isolated in embracing the use of narratives in medicine, which is why I warm to the likelihood of narratives being used to inform future medical judgments. It would be unfortunate if medicine moved fully to squeeze the art out of its science by marginalising the narrative. Stories aren't just better at capturing the bigger picture, but the smaller picture too. I'm thinking of the article about the depressed man given the drug Zoloft. The degree of transformation in the patient was just as impressive as the length of observation. No formal research can offer a 40-year lead-in or a 19-year follow-up. Few studies report on both symptoms and social progress. Research reduces information about many people. Narratives retain the texture of life in all its forms. We need storytelling, which is why I'll keep harping on about it until the message gets through. Now look at extract two. Extract two. Questions thirty-seven to forty-two. You hear the monologue of Dr. Thaddeus Roxby giving a lecture on the types of eczema. You now have ninety seconds to read questions thirty-seven to forty-two.
Eczema is not a single health condition. It is a recognizable reaction method seen in a number of skin diseases. Atopic dermatitis is a common cause of eczema that is more prevalent in the patients with asthma and hay fever. The signs and symptoms of eczema include tiny blisters or vesicles that can weep and ooze, eventually producing crusted, thickened plaques of skin. It is always quite itchy. It is significant to distinguish the different causes of eczema, as the effective treatments will also differ. Eczema starts as red, raised, tiny blisters containing a clear fluid atop red, elevated plaques, and when these blisters break, the affected skin starts to weep and ooze. In chronic eczema, the blisters are less prominent and the skin is elevated, thickened, and scaling. There are about 11 distinct types of skin conditions that produce eczema. Atopic dermatitis tends to begin early in life with those with a predisposition to inhalant allergies, but it probably does not have an allergic basis. Characteristically, rashes occur on the cheeks, neck, elbow, and knee creases, and ankles. Irritant dermatitis occurs when the skin is repeatedly exposed to toxic substances or due to excessive washing. Allergic contact dermatitis occurs after repeated exposures to the same allergic substance. The immune recognition system becomes activated at the site of the next exposure and produces a dermatitis. Poison ivy allergy is a good example of allergic contact dermatitis. Stasis dermatitis commonly occurs on the swollen lower legs of patients who have poor blood circulation in the veins of the legs. Fungal infections can produce a pattern similar to many other types of eczema. However, the fungus can be visualized with a scraping under the microscope or grown in culture. Scabies is caused by an infestation by the human itch mite and produces a rash very similar to other forms of eczema. Pomphylix or dyshydriotic eczema is very common and affects the hands and occasionally the feet. By creating an itchy rash composed of tiny blisters on the sides of the fingers or toes and palms or soles. Lichen simplex chronicus produces thickened plaques of skin commonly found on the shins and neck. Numular eczema is a non-specific term for coin-shaped plaques of scaling skin most often on the lower legs of aged persons. In the xerotic eczema, the skin will crack and ooze due to excessive dryness. Sybaretic dermatitis produces a rash on the scalp, face, ears, and occasionally the mid-chest in adults. In infants, it produces a weepy, oozy rash behind the ears and are often quite extensive, involving the entire body. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. Thank you.